Okay. Uh, I'm Pat Yampietro. Most of you guys who are here know me if you're just jumping into the Zoom or you just got here today. Um, I'm the geospatial tech officer here at CSUMB. I'm the drone coordinator. And um, I'm going to talk to you today about high precision mapping. Um, and I'm just to give you a little story. Uh, in my naivety and ambition last night, I decided to completely restructure this talk and cut it way, way down and give us an outside thing to do. And I was working on making that happen until about five minutes ago. So it may be glitchy, but we're going to try. Uh, so anyway, let's, let's just get going because there's a lot. How do I get the slide to advance? Uh, I have to click on the screen. There we go. All right. So um, as an introduction, we're going to talk about why precision mapping. Why can't we just go out there and just fly a drone around and uh, take a bunch of pictures and then have a nice map? My map looks great. Um, why do I need to worry about this? Um, there was a lot that I cut out of this talk. I will unhide the slides that get shared. Um, so all that stuff that I'm not going to say today about the nuts and bolts of how GPS works that you probably don't care about anyway um, will be available to you. But um, I'm not going to touch on those topics today as much as I would have. Then we're going to talk about uh, the difference between accuracy and precision um, very quickly. How to improve the precision of your mapping products by a couple different means by using RTK or PPK GNSS or GPS on either your aircraft by uh, when you collect your GCPs and uh, a couple of considerations about GPS equipment selection. Uh, next slide, please. So why, what is high precision and why do we need it? Turns out structure from motion software can make some really amazingly internally consistent and aesthetically pleasing models without any GPS positions at all. We don't even need position. You can take your phone inside a building where you have no GPS and take a bunch of pictures around a statue or something uh, and Pix4D or another uh, structure from motion software will stitch it all together and it'll look beautiful. But the fact is that if we want to, well, the tie points that, that make all that happen are created from the features in the photos. It's not the position of the camera that determines how well that works. So the software mushes everything together so that it fits. But if we wanna do studies in the outdoors and we wanna have repeatability, if we wanna do change detection, and I know that was a topic that somebody brought up this morning that for a breakout group, we wanna be able to go back to the same place multiple times and map it over and over again, and know that the differences we're seeing in our map products are real differences, and not problems with our positioning or our models, then we need high precision. We need to be able to get our maps accurate to real world absolute coordinates and they need to be repeatable. Next. Actually, before you jump, um, this is an example of a, of a repeat mapping survey of a beach where we were looking at coastal erosion. And so we mapped it once with an EB RTK we came back later uh, and did it again. And the areas that are red are places where there was lots of erosion. And the areas that are green are places where there was accretion or sediment was added. And without having really good positioning on both of those data sets, we don't know if the differences we're seeing are differences caused by the noise uh, of the positioning of the data. Next. So, this is gonna be the uh, uh, very short, how GPS works part of the talk. Um, everything has GPS in it now, your phone, uh, air tags that you can put on things, your car, everything is GPS enabled. And, but, but the important thing is that they all work relatively the same way, but they don't work relatively as well. Um, some GPS units or GNSS units, I'm gonna use those terms interchangeably, I'll tell you, the difference between them in a second. Uh, the one in your phone is good for maybe a few meters. You've probably noticed it kind of jumps around. Position isn't really necessarily where you really are. So it's useless from the standpoint of trying to do high precision mapping. A dedicated unit, well, 
the GPS that's in your drone is better than the one in your phone, but it's still not all that good. It's still a meter or two at best. A dedicated unit that has a source of differential corrections like WAS or SBAS, um, that's a satellite-based correction service. And we'll get into what differential corrections are in a minute. Can do one or two meters or maybe even submeter if you're lucky. But if you want to get down to submeter, you really need either RTK, which stands for real-time kinematic, or PPK, which means pop, which is post-processed kinematic. And I'll define those terms better uh, in a bit next week. So just real briefly, three big parts to the GNSS system. There's the satellites, that's the space segment. There's the ground control system that's usually controlled by the government. That's the control segment. And then there's us, we're the user segment. And we're the ones who want to know where we are. Next. There's 55 original GPS satellites in our government system. There's also a number of other uh, systems that I'll show you. But the important thing to remember is that they're all orbiting and the Earth is spinning and the number of satellites we can see at any given time is changing all the time. So one way to enhance the accuracy and precision of your, of your uh, mapping is to choose a time when the satellite constellation is best. Because especially if you're in an area with high trees or cliffs on one side or, or, or mountains, or you're in a city in an urban environment and there's tall buildings, then you wanna plan for when you have the best satellites. So I said there's other uh, countries have satellite systems. GLONASS is the Russian system. I don't know if we have access to GLONASS right now, given the, the uh, world political situation. Galileo is the European Union. Uh, they're not on here, but Beidou is uh, Chinese. Anyway, used to be just the US and that's why it was called GPS. It was Global Positioning System. Now it's called GNSS, which stands for Global Naviga Navigation Satellite System. And it's the whole uh, suite of uh, satellite constellations, depending on your GPS unit, it may be able to use only one or multiple satellite constellations. But the more satellites, usually the better. So uh, a unit that can see more of them is, is a good thing. So how do we, how does, a, how does GPS tell us where we are? Does anybody know? Is it like tracking everybody? No, it's all based on clocks, right? So click. It's all based on satellite ranging. So our receiver on the ground or in the air is receiving uh, pulses from the satellites and it's the time of travel from the satellite to the, the receiver that tells that receiver how far that particular satellite is away. And the receiver knows where all the satellites should be in the sky. And as long as you have, really you need four, I know I'm only showing you three here. As long as you have at least four, you can figure out where you are. And the, the method by which that, it's actually pretty complicated, how it knows that it's 60 milliseconds is kind of tricky, but we're not gonna go into that. Next, please. So I told you some, some GPS can know where they are very well, and some aren't so good at knowing where they are, but all of them to varying degrees are subject to uncertainty or error. And the main reasons, the main causes for that are obstruction, multipath, and atmospheric delay. So to define those just real quickly, next please. Obstruction just means there's something in between you and the satellite. And it may be there all the time, meaning you can't see the satellite at all, or it may be intermittent and causing you to have a satellite and not have a satellite. And that can cause error in your, in your readings. Next please. Multipath is where the satellite uh, signal, you may be seeing it directly on the receiver, but you also may be getting a bounce off of something else, a building, a tree, um, any kind of structure. Um, if your antenna is really, really close to the ground, if it's like on the ground, you get bad multipath sometimes just from people standing around it. So generally best to have the receiver not right on the ground. Um, so multipath, 
means that the time that we're calculating for how long that signal took to get to us isn't a straight line, right? So that makes our position move around because we think it took longer to get to us. So we, we think it's farther away. Next, please. And then atmospheric inter interference from the ionosphere and the troposphere can cause a lot of noise too. Click, please. So not only does it cause just basic interference and noise, it also causes the signals to refract the same way that if you take a glass of water and you put a straw in it and the light uh, is refracting because of the water surface. Well, the, the radio signals that the, that the satellites use to, that the satellites are beaming out that we're trying to receive with our receiver, they also do that when they go through the different layers of our atmosphere. So that causes noise. So, because of all these sources of noise, we, uh, we need a way to, well, we need a way to reduce these sources of noise. And the best way is a system called differential GPS. And maybe some of you guys know what it is, but I'll go ahead and explain it in cartoon terms really fast. Um, click, please. So if we're out and about in the wild with our rover GPS, and we're getting signals from the satellites, and it's telling us, you're here. Click we may be getting the wrong position. So even though in reality we're here, the GPS position that we're calculating says here. And that's because of all those sources of noise that I just explained quickly. But if we have a base station that's on a known location and we've told this base station exactly where it is, we've given it very precise coordinates for its location, it's gonna receive the same satellite signals and it's gonna calculate its position. Click. And that's gonna be wrong too, but it knows where it really is. Click, please. So it can figure out the difference between where the satellite said it was and where it really is. Click please. And if we can send that information to the rover and the rover's close enough to the base station that it's experiencing the same type of noise and the same type of in, inaccuracies, click please, then we can correct the rover's position to be more accurate as well. So that's why it's called differential correction is because we're finding the difference between the calculated position and the true position, and we're applying that as a correction. Make sense? So without differential correction, standard or autonomous GPS as these are all approximate, they're all just ballpark, but it has uh, those sorts of uh, levels of noise in terms of uh, error in meters. But with differential correction, we can remove some of them completely and we can greatly reduce the other ones. So we can get our accuracy of our, of our positions down to sub meter and sub decimeter often. So just to kind of summarize back, uh, autonomous GPS with no correction source at all can be, not always, but can be as bad as 15 meters uncertainty. With DGPS, either real time or post-process, we can get down to a few meters. And with RTK or PPK, that is real time kinematic or post-process kinematic, we can get down to just a few centimeters. Their question. Very good question. Very good question. So um, it's uh, it's there's not an absolute answer, but uh, within twenty kilometers is best. Within ten kilometers is better. Um, we're going to go outside and uh, do something uh, after I'm done boring you. Uh, and we're gonna be using a uh, base station that's 300 meters away. So it's on the roof of the science building. So that's pretty close. Uh, next. Okay. Um, oh, that's right, I had something else to say, go back. <laughs> uh, and now click, there it is. Um, this, these numbers are for the horizontal uncertainty. Vertical is almost always worse by uh, 
sometimes an order of magnitude, but usually at least you know two to five times. And this is why your drone doesn't use GPS for its vertical position, unless it's RTK. Your, your, your altitude of your drone is not derived from GPS, it's derived from a barometer. When the drone's on the ground, it checks the barometric pressure and zeroes it out, and the relative difference as it changes altitude is how it calculates how high it is. It's not using GPS to do that because of the noise. If it was five or 10 meters off, would you wanna be using that when you're that close to the ground? Probably not. Okay, next. I feel like Marco Rubio over here. Okay, um, so summary, uh, there's lots of interference, lots of noise. DGPS tells us uh, better where we are by applying corrections that are uh, generated by a place with a known location. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the difference between uh, uh, autonomous, PPK and RTK as we go. Next. This was where the you guys can go outside and do something time would be, but uh, I'm just gonna keep rolling. So all right, accuracy and precision. Who's seen this targety thing before? Probably anybody who's taken a science class almost. All right, so I'm just gonna go real fast. Best case scenario. So accuracy is how close your measurement is to the true value. Precision is how repeatable your measurements are, how close your measurements cluster. So obviously the best case scenario is accurate and precise. Not accurate, but precise is pretty good too, because if you can find out what this is, it's just like differential correction, right? You can move all those values. And since they're so close together, they're all gonna be pretty close to the real value. This is probably the third best. Um, accurate kind of but not precise all over the map but basically around the true value and then this is the worst case scenario where you're not accurate and you're not precise so when we talk about mapping products and we talk about some people will use the word accuracy and precision completely interchangeably some people will only say precision some people will only say accuracy and it's important to just make sure you know when someone's telling you oh this is accurate to 20 centimeters exactly what they mean so they mean it's internally consistent to 20 centimeters from the quality control port they got from, from PIX4D when they didn't do any GCPs at all? Um, or do they mean it really is accurate to 20 centimeters to real world coordinates? Next, please. And that also holds true for the measure of accuracy people give you. So if they say uh, it's accurate to 10 centimeters, are they talking about the root mean square error? Are they talking about standard deviation, the circular error of prob probability? Um, there's different measures of accuracy and precision. And when you're buying a GPS, for example, when they tell you, oh, this is good to five centimeters, find out what they mean by that. Don't just say, oh, great, I'm good. Next, please. So how can we make our maps more precise? We can use RTK or PPK techniques, differentially corrected uh, techniques, either or both of our aircraft and or our ground control points. If we get positions for those that are highly precise, our map product will be highly precise. Next. So we talked about ground control points. I don't know in the PIX4D uh, processing or, or the open drone map or anywhere, did you actually use ground control points and, and mark them and everything? Oh, great, so I can go fast. So obviously the idea is you put them out before the survey, before the flight, you make sure they're visible, you make sure they don't move, um, and you make sure that they end up in the photos. Try to get them in as many photos as you can in the processing, you go mark them, you give the processing software, go ahead and start clicking as I'm talking. Actually, go back. <laughs> Not that far. Um, you, you, uh, you, you tell the software what the coordinates for those things were that you just clicked on, and then it figures things out. This is a product, um, somebody got smart and created these smart GCPs. They're actually, they have a little solar panel in them. They've got the standard target on them. They've got a battery in them and they've got an RT or a PPK GPS in each one of the targets. So you take them all out and you throw them around your site and then you just leave them there while you fly. 
and then you go pick them all up. You never have to stand over them with a GPS because they've got it, they're collecting all during your flight. You download the data, you post-process it with their proprietary subscription paid service, and then you have really good positions for all your GCP. Uh, rules of thumb about how many, where to put them. Uh, some people use a rule of thumb, five at least per battery. Um, if you're only going to use them to validate and you're only using them as checkpoints, you may be able to get away with just one or two. But if you're going to use them for georeferencing, you're probably going to need at least three. And the bigger your area, the, the more you're going to need. And you want them not clustered anywhere. You want them distributed throughout. Go ahead. Uh, this is just real quick, an example of, this is a GCP. It's actually a two meter piece of blue tarp with a white X on it. We're using that same beach erosion survey. Click, please. There's a more close up of it. So it's just white paint. Go ahead. Uh, one more. Whoops. That shouldn't. Anyway, the whole thing about them not moving. Ah, so this is actually, this was captured by the drone as it went over this GCP. It captured a good Samaritan cleaning the beach helping us. We've actually had them bring our GCPs to us before too, but this one didn't. She just stuffed it in her bag and we never got it back. So she was, she was well-meaning, but this GCP did us no good because you can't see the center of it. Um, next. Uh, yeah, there she is. Next. Also, wait a minute. I don't know. But, oh, okay. That's the other thing. If conditions are changing, you need, so you can tell I do a lot of marine and coastal stuff. Um, if the conditions are changing and you put them out in there and draw high and dry, and then the tide comes in, you might be using waders to get the position, but hopefully it doesn't wash away before you get there. Next. So this is the process you guys did in PIX4D. I'm not gonna talk about it because you guys already know what it is. Next. Um, but it's worth mentioning the quality control port report in PIX4D will um, tell you how many uh, GCPs you had, how many you marked. It'll tell you the root mean square error in X, Y, and Z of those GCPs. Um, and these GCPs are used to actually georeference the project. So the project is moved around and the picture images are moved around to fit the GCP coordinates you gave it. Next. That's to be distinguished from checkpoints, which you can reserve some of your GCPs, not use them to georeference with, but use them only for validation. So you give it, let's say you have 10 GCPs, you give it seven of them, and you have it use them to georeference the project, and then you give it two more and you say, these are checkpoints, not GCPs. Just tell me how well they match the model you came up with, and that'll give you a better measure of your absolute accuracy because these weren't used to position the project these are only used against it to see how good the project fits next uh right so if you want to do precise stuff you need a you need a a, a unit capable of dgps and preferably rtk or ppk next uh the difference between, so this is autonomous. This is no corrections at all. This is PPK, which means that we're doing post-process kinematic. That means in real time in the field, we don't have precise locations, but we're collecting all the data that we can use to come up with those precise locations when we get data from a base station after the fact, and we do it on our computer. We can actually use a, an online service to do post-process kinematic or do it locally, but the point is, we need to get data from a base station that's nearby our, our survey area um, to be able to do PPK. And RTK, the R means real time, which means we're getting those corrections in real time. Our, so in this case, our photographs and the EXIF tags on our photographs aren't precise until we post-process our GPS data and then replace the EXIF tags with the precise information. In this case, we have precise position in real time. And so 
we, uh, our XF tags are already uh, of high precision. So we don't have to do as much post uh, in this one, obviously, because it doesn't say post-processing in the name. So if you can get an RTK capable aircraft or PPK, then you're, uh, you're gonna have a, a better, uh, more high, highly precise mapping project, product. This is what we're gonna use today. This is actually a regular Mavic 2 Pro, but with a bolted on, added on aftermarket PPK system. So this has its own G GNSS receiver and antenna and a SIM card in it, or not a SIM card, uh, an SD card. And it's gonna record observables from the satellites independent of the GPS of the Mavic onto the SD card. And we're gonna have to use PPK to process that to get precise locations. And then we're gonna replace the position stamps on our images that came from the Mavic itself with the stuff that came from the Topo drone. This is a, I believe it's a Russian company. They're based out of Switzerland. The Topo drone add-on, PPK add-on costs about the same as the Mavic itself. So it's about 1800 bucks or something like that. So we're gonna use this today, hopefully. Next. Um, so GPS receivers, today we're gonna use an MLID Reach RS2. Um, technology has gotten crazy. It's changed so much. Um, what used to be much bigger, and I had some old relic -y stuff that I'm not even gonna bother dragging out. It just makes me look old. Um, uh, everything's gotten smaller and cheaper. So this can do what a much bigger system that used to cost twenty to $50,000, this is about $2,000. Um, it's got the receiver in it, you put it on a pole, it talks to your data collection device, your tablet via Wi-Fi, um, works with NTRIP. You can use two of them together and have one of them as a base station and it talks to the other one if you don't use NTRIP. So, uh, so yeah, great system. There's other systems by EOS. Um, Trimble, of course, is a GNSS uh, dinosaur, uh, but they're, they're still making good stuff. It's just all really expensive. Um, and... Uh, uh, basically, for precision work, you definitely want to be using a survey pole. You want the antenna a known height above the ground, and you want to be able to put it right on a spot with a pointy end, and you want to be able to know its level so that you know your, your antenna is positioned right over the center of your GCP. Next. Uh, there's a low-cost, semi-low-cost unit from a company called Bad Elf. Um, this is the surveyor. It's got SBAS built in and can do one to two meter with that. Um, it can also receive NTRIP, but there's some limitations on the formats it can use. Um, and we've been able to get those units to do meter-ish. So if you, it all depends on the, on the requirements of your project. If you don't need high, high precision, then, uh, then maybe you don't need to spend as much money on a, G, on a GNSS receiver. So these are about 600, 650 bucks. Um, some of the older units that aren't able to uh, do NTRIP um, can log a file that you can still do PPK with. So this is a Trimble 5700. These cost $20,000 uh, 10 years ago. And now you can probably get one on eBay for about a hundred bucks or 50 bucks. I don't know, maybe not that low, but it's ridiculous how, uh, how much the technology changes, how quickly, and how much the, uh, the older stuff just loses its value. Um, so if you're in this kind of business, you gotta be prepared to spend money on gear that is gonna be replaced uh, pretty quickly. Next, please. Um, so NTRIP, I've said NTRIP a whole bunch of times. What's NTRIP? Stands for Network Transport of RTCM and RTCM, so it's an acronym within an acronym. RTCM is, uh, stands for real-time corrections. We'll just leave it at that. So it's RTCM over the internet, basically. So it's co corrections that you receive over the internet. And for that to happen, there needs to be a server on the internet that's putting out these corrections. And you need to be able to connect to that server. So you need an internet connection and you probably need some kind of account or credentials to connect to that server. 
depending on who's running the server, they may have it wide open and let anybody use it, or they may have it uh, more locked down. We have a community base station here at CSUMB that is doing NTRIP all the time. Um, uh, if you want access to it because you're doing work locally, of course, as I said before, and the question from the, from the Zoom was, 20 kilometers is about as far away as you wanna to be to use any base station. And so if you're around CSUMB, that's an option. And if you wanna use it, uh, I can give you access. Um, another statewide for California resource is the California Real-Time Network or CERTAIN. Uh, CERTAIN is, is run by uh, uh, folks down at, uh, at UC San Diego and SOPAC. And um, they have a network of about 700 stations all up and down the, the, the state. They're broken into zones and you, uh, the server you connect to is, is specific to the zone you're in and uh, you can uh, get your corrections from CERTAIN. It's free, but you do have to contact them to get uh, a login and a password. Um, unless you, so Caltrans uses them, all kinds of folks use certain. Um, one thing about if you do get a certain account, what they will give you, unless you ask otherwise, they will give you an account that is good for one connection only. So concurrently. So if you have a GPS unit that you wanna do your GCPs with and a drone that you wanna fly and they both need NTRIP, you need an account that has two streams not just one, so it's just a consideration. Next week. So, can't believe I got this far. Uh, not all projects need high precision. You might not require this kind of uh, effort and expense, but if you're gonna try to do change detection uh, or some of those other activities, you're gonna want survey grade accuracy. Um, RTK and PPK are the ways to do it. And, uh, Regardless, you should be doing GCPs with your project just so you know how good the project is internally, if not in absolute coordinates. So rather than take questions and take up our time for going outside, um, you can use the Google Doc, the Q&A Google Doc. Those of us that are in the room can ask questions once we get outside because we'll be watching a drone go over for 10 minutes anyway. Um, and, uh, and the Zoom folks, uh, maybe one of our moderators can bring questions out there, or I don't think we're gonna have Zoom out there, but we'll figure out something. Next slide, please. Before we all get up. So here's what we're gonna do. This is one, my two, two new slides tonight, or last night. We're gonna go out and we're gonna set up, I thought we were gonna set up three MLIDs, but uh, that thing about five minutes, until five minutes before the, uh, talk started, I was working on something. Well, that was because the MLIDs weren't playing, playing nice. They were fine at my house last night, but uh, they hadn't been used on campus for a long time and they weren't connecting to the campus Wi-Fi well, so we had a problem. So we're gonna set up one MLID, the one that we have working, um, and we're gonna have a team that's gonna go out and uh, mark our GCPs once they're put out. We're gonna have a group that goes out and puts GCPs. I've got a bunch of them here. And then we're gonna fly this drone about a 10 minute, 15 minute flight um, to collect data. And because it's PPK, we're gonna get uh, a, an autonomous flight initially. We'll have a whole set of pictures that have not so good position. And then we'll, I'll do the uh, PPK processing and provide a set of photos that have the more precise locations for their uh, in their EXIF tag. And we can look at both data sets. I'll make all the raw data available to everybody, but I'll process it as well and put it on Pix4D Cloud where you can get to it and, uh, and it'll be fun, hopefully. So we're gonna go back out to the flight area, the same place that we flew. Oh wait, Nick, one more, one more slide. Sorry, wait. So we're gonna go out to the flight area, uh, same place we flew yesterday. This is kind of the flight plan. But I wanna say that I did move these borders on both the east and the west side all the way to the trail. So the crew that goes out to place uh, GCPs, I'm gonna give you, uh, and we'll probably have you know, five or 10 people will get a GCP or two each. Um, I'm gonna give you a, a, a piece of paper, a, a printout of this, 
and you can mark the approximate, you know, just ballpark area where you left them so that we can find them all again. Um, but you can go all the way to the trail. This is this is kind of the borderline, the trail on each side, this trail to the south. Um, and there's actually already a big white X right here that we can use for a GPT as well. Okay, so that's it. Let's all uh, roll outside. Thank you. Can people on Zoom okay. hear me? Everybody hear me? So we got a lot of people to do this. Uh, normally when we do outdoor uh, kind of uh, groupy stuff, Thank you. I'll get as close as I can to Pat. This is crossed. Okay, so as I said inside the past, uh, I need a few people, uh, 10 DVDs, and some aluminum stakes, and a couple of uh, maps. And I want people to go out there. Put down GCPs. Remember the kind of concepts of how to put them down is they've got to be visible from the sky. So don't put them right underneath the tree or something. Um, don't put them in poison oak. Uh, you don't necessarily have to stake down all four corners. Um, some places the ground may be kind of hard if it is, move it until you can find somewhere where you can stick in one of these uh, aluminum stakes. Two corners will probably be enough unless you notice that a corner is flopping over and then use more stakes. But I don't have. 40 stakes. I have 10 GCPs, but I don't have 40 stakes. Um, so that's going to be one task, and you guys can sort yourselves out. Another task is going to be actually going to the GCPs with the RTK GPS and Chris Greer. Where is he? He's back there somewhere. There he is. He's, uh, he's our resident uh, MLID uh, expert. So he's going to walk you through doing that. The plan was for you to have, we were going to have three of these things. And I was going to break you up into teams, and well, two of them don't work right now. They worked last night at my house, just fine. Um, when I got them here, uh, not so much. So, so three things we're going to do: put out GCPs, mark them with a uh, an RTK GPS, and that's again, it's RTK mode, not PPK, and it's getting corrections from the CSUMB community base station, which is on the roof of our science building. It's you saw uh, uh, where the Otter Student Union is. It's a little that way from that. Uh, you can actually see the antenna. It's near the corner of the building. You can see it. Up there. Um, it's very accurate. It's providing intro corrections at a one second interval, um, and it, it works real well, and it's very close. So its corrections are very valid for where we are. Then the last thing we're going to do, actually, the marking of the, uh, of the control points for the GCPs may, depending on time, may have an after the flight, but we want to get the GCPs out there first. So let me grab those. Okay, well, it didn't get going good. And we'll do it after. All right, so in this bag are 10 GCPs. I'll put them right here. And in this bag are a bunch of stakes and a mat one mallet only. Um, but as I said, the stakes won't go in real easy on something like this, but out there it's really, really sandy soil. It should, they should go right in. And if they don't, just don't put the GCP there. So I'm gonna leave these. Let me get tangled in my course. I'm gonna leave these right here. And don't be shy. If you want to be a GCP pers person, take GCPs and put them out there because we can't fly until we have them. So we're all gonna be standing around here if you guys don't do that. <laughs> yeah, take a couple each and a this is a large part of what it's like to do field work. Um, but not this one. Oh. Again, watch out for poison. Oh, 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 yes. Oh, yes. Oh, I was going to give you some maps to mark where you put them. 
Can you follow you guys? Yeah. <laughs> right, sure. <laughs> you can uh, make it through if you want to introduce yourself. Hello. Oh, hi, hey. Room people. How's I'm Tashmina. Um, we're all PhD students. Oh, I'm Perfectly there. Don't worry about the map. Don't worry about the map. Yes, I'm Brandon. Okay. Nice to meet you all. I'm going to see Davis. Uh, we're going to follow you. <laughs> okay, so we have a uh, ground control plate. We're going to um, put it out on the ground so that um, we'll mark this point with a GPS and then the drone will take a photo of this point and we'll be able to um, geo-reference the drone image later based on the GPS point and the gun control point. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Going this way, maybe somewhere like right here. Oh, yeah, so right there, or like right here. Uh huh, by the bench. Okay, yep. and we're wanting to mark where we put the gun control points down on the map so we can recover them later. Yeah, you want to add it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we want to find a location where the view isn't obstructed for the drone so that um, the drone can take a really clear picture. There's no poison oak. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we just need to do it. Yeah, unless it's windy. Could someone in Zoom put in chat just verify you're still hearing us? <laughs> yeah, not good. Thank you. All right, so what, we're right across from where the bench is. Crocodiles, yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Which side do you want to go on? You guys there's like one over there, so. Okay, we're going into the trees. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
um, because later when we work with the, um, when we process the data and we geo-reference it, we'll want to have um, images from multiple angles that we can locate the ground control point and um, geo-reference those images. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we want them spread out over the study area. So the software can use them to improve the ge geometric model. And it should not be linear either. It should be, if they're all in a line, even though they're spread apart, it doesn't help the model improve the accuracy very much. Yeah, should we check that area on that and see? Because we're probably one of the good Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we're like around here. Done, team. Yeah, field work. <laughs> a lot less bird flashing than they normally feel. Right? Yeah, this is pretty tolerable yeah. territory. To I feel like it's like we're preparing for like a Easter egg hunt, like hiding if you keep feet and then the next team has to find you. I bet we will we'll be the ones who can use the same one. Oh no, it's just, I guess the model next year is that that we only have one um like one instrument to take the GPS part. Oh right. So We're gonna have to walk time. around and... we've done something like with exercises where you uh we lay out decoy turkeys. Uh-huh. And then the 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 goal is to find them and count them uh, using uh, the images. Yeah, that's nice. It's like that orienteering. Yes. Yeah. Your high school did that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Beautiful out here. It's almost like a botanical garden. Yeah, it is. <laughs> All right, looks like that's getting ready to launch the drone over there.
Continue to do that throughout the flight. Um, meanwhile, the GPS of the Mavic itself is what it gets navigating using, and what's going to mark the position on the uh, on the photo geotag. So uh, there it goes. Okay. So it's not just going to go up to the sky and sit there until the battery runs out. <laughs> I'm using drone deploy. Actually, drone deploy is not controlling it. It's controlling it. Drone deploy has uploaded a flight plan to it, and it's following that flight plan. There's not even, it will actually keep doing it if I lose connection to it, unless I've told it to come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is kind of the watching paint dry part. <laughs> but... Um, If we uh, try to stay relatively still while it's actually overhead capturing us, it's better. We may actually end up with some cool, you know, droning. Anybody been looking at Twitter? There's some good stuff there. Some people, some people post, yes? Yeah. So it's connecting now, but. Since I haven't updated my software, I don't have that option. What, uh, what coordinate system do you want to use? Uh, it should be. When you go into survey, okay, let's use uh, NAD 83 2011. NAD 83 2011. And it should already be on the tablet, actually, the geoid model to get to uh, NAD 88. So, uh, yeah, let's use orthometric height. And uh, NABD 88 UTM zone 10 north. And, uh, NABD, I'm sorry, NAD 83 2011 UTM zone 10. And the vertical would be NABD 88, the North American vertical datum of 88 as defined by GOA 12. So Chris is putting into the GPS unit the coordinate system uh, in which we want to record our GCP position. Recall that the, G the GPS system, the GNSS system, gives you your position. The raw data is always in lat long WGS84, uh, and the uh, vertical is height above ellipsoid. The ellipsoid is a model of the Earth's surface, which is uh, not real. Um, so, so the drone data you get normally is in height above ellipsoid as well. Um, this particular GPS is smart enough to convert to a projected coordinate system instead of a spherical one. So we're using UTM zone 10. That's where we are. Um, 
And it's also able to take that height above ellipsoid and translate it to uh, a, data, a vertical datum of your choice, which we're going to use the North American vertical datum of 88, and 88. I know a lot of people are nodding their heads. Um, and that's the difference between ellipsoid and that datum is defined by uh, an ellipsoid model. In this case, we're using GOA 12D. What was, your, what was your vertical again? NADD 88. Yeah. North American vertical datum of 88. We have to download it. Uh, it should be on there already. If, if you do have to download it, get the 12D. It doesn't take long. This drone's still in the air. You got that. Anybody want to see the uh, screen where the drone is right now? So, if you guys did the autonomous flight uh, during during uh, flight training, you've already seen this. But basically, when you're doing an autonomous flight, you've got your Boostro Fedonic flight plan, <laughs> and uh, the drone is just flying along. You can see a little triangle. Flying along one of the lines. How many flight lines? Uh, we are more than half done. Yeah. It was like I don't know, twelve lines or something like that. It said thirteen minutes. One way you can monitor your, or predict your battery level is to see how many points it drops. The technique to monitor your battery during the flight when you're doing autonomous mission is to estimate like for every flight line, how many uh, percentage of the battery drops. And then you can do some calculations like, okay, I'll, we get about six more lines and then we have to bring it home. Yeah, one one rule of thumb that I use is is you know when we're getting down to near thirty percent, I look where it is on the flight line, and if it's near the end of a flight line, and I happen to be kind of in the middle, I'll let it finish that line and come back because it's got to come back anyway, right? So you might as well have it be recording data on the way back. Is that a fix? Uh, I put my hand on. Ah, you lost your fix. Did you cover it? I got you. Um, when you go into survey mode, let's go with like a one point eight meter. Uh, height and extend the pole up to one point eight. Um so so yeah you kind of judge well it's going farther and farther away and I'm getting closer and closer to 30. Um if the end of the flight line is way far away you bring it back sooner. Um, just try to be efficient with when you call it back and and not sending it way 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 out again to to start a line because um, it's gonna pick up where it left off right so um so yeah it can't always be optimal, but uh, you try to waste the least amount of battery in time. Yes. Um, you get situations where the multi-path air at your GCP is different than the base station messing with the differential? or If you've got a lot of multi-path, um, the RTK may not help you as much as it would have. Yes. So you just got to be strategic. Yeah. Right so, so the biggest bang for buck for using the RTK and the data from the base station is getting rid of that uh, atmospheric. Uh, that, and that's the biggest uh, culprit in causing noise in your position. So, um, and that's why you want to be close. You know, the is base station. Fog mess with the atmospheric pressure? Uh, yeah, but it's, 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 it, there's a lot of atmosphere. I mean, the fog is in this much of it. Um, but, but the reason the base station needs to be close is that it should be experiencing the same kind of conditions as you are, because that way its corrections will be valid for you. Um, if it's 200 miles away, it may be very different there. Um, it may even be seeing different satellites. That's the other thing. You guys got to both be seeing the same satellite because, uh, well, that's just the way it works. Just a reminder, everybody, it is a little bit afternoon right now. Lunch today is 12 to 1. It's not two hours. It's only one hour because at 1 o'clock, we have uh, a session. Well, you can know, though, he's going to talk about decision agriculture. We have finished our last booster orthodontic line, and all we're doing now is a perimeter. So it's coming home soon. And then as soon as it starts heading back, we can 
Yeah. Anybody who wants to. Uh, Somebody take... from each group at least has to tell us where they put them. So we're not looking for the there, there are some maps um, with marks on them. Yes. Okay. So uh, make sure those go with the GPS. <laughs> so you're not wandering around. So, so this, for those that aren't going to go out and, and do the GCP marking, um, a survey poll like this is real handy. Uh, there's also, you can attach a couple legs to it, not like a full tripod, but just two legs. And that way you can set it up and get it all leveled up and everything and let go of it and let it sit there for a while if you need to. But typically when we're doing this, we only, it only takes about five seconds. The GPS averages as long as uh, you want it to over the point. And so the default that you set it up with is five seconds. So when you press measure this point, it'll average for five seconds and then it'll mark that spot and it'll say, okay, I'm ready for the next one. Um, but you put the, the pointy end of the stick, there's a grommet in the middle of the, of the GCP. Um, you don't have to get it exactly on the black and white X thing because there's actually a hole in it. Um, you put that through the hole. You don't want to drive it way into the ground just on the surface. And then you use this little bubble level here to uh, to make sure that it's centered and level over the over the X. And then you press the go button. Sometimes it's easier to have somebody else press it while you hold it level. Um, and five seconds, and you go to the next one. Um, yeah. It appears the, uh, the aircraft is doing leaks. We have that whole upgrade so drone deploy has a number of of sort of default settings um switches you can uh you can tell it to do enhance 3d or, or whatever and that changes the flight plan parameters a little bit this one that i chose does include a perimeter with some obliques so i think it's i forget what it's called it's almost done it's uh Going back to the corner where it started doing the perimeter, just about there now, and then it's probably going to come straight home. And then there's one at the whole point. I told him to put them all in poison. How many did they put out? <laughs> I don't know. How many got put out? Does anybody know? All 10? Two. Okay. Two, two. There isn't one other person around that map. Okay. I'll go with you. <laughs> this one, they don't have a pen, so they poked a hole on the paper. Hey, points for resourcefulness. Oh, he has to go. Best case, normally, you mark them before the flight. Um, then you're done. Uh, if you can't do it before, uh, then you do it after, and hopefully. They're still there. Oh, you can yeah, have a move. You can set up here. Is there yeah, a so you can uh, it's only pressing mm -hmm. the overall time window. You set up the flight um, placement the and collection the measurements time. are so spread right out in time or tight. There you go. So okay. this is. Uh, I think tight is better, but how much it matters, I don't know. Okay. Depends on who you ask. Probably. Say for that. There you go. Yeah, so, some people think that. So essentially, um, you can do it only. Okay, we're coming home. Average. So. Yeah. Yeah. so what about the fix right now? The Mavic isn't always so great at that. Um, the RTK. Uh, if I brought the Phantom 4 RTK out here, it hits the pad every time, right in the middle, right where it's took off. It just got centimeter accurate GPS in real time. Oops. See, I do it too. Well, close enough. I was fighting with it. I didn't want to. All right. All right. Okay. We'll head out. We'll try to find the 
I'll uh, I'll come out too as soon as I put this stuff away. I know we're four of them. All right, that's it for our start this way. What's that? Are you are you gonna show uh, collecting a ground control? Oh yeah, let's let's follow Chris okay. out into the field and we'll show <laughs> collecting the drone. Uh, we don't need the speaker anymore. Everybody else, go get a quick lunch and come back at one o'clock. If you want to watch how to do a high accuracy survey, point forward. Yeah, I can yeah. help you. You want to be the videographer? Yeah, okay. yeah go for it. Yeah. I'll be right behind you. Just, just follow. Uh, Emlet, that's the name of the company that makes them. Yeah. Thank you. E M L I D. And so, both things, either whether you're using your phone or a tablet, um, I usually use my phone to collect the the data, but everything has to be connected to the same um, wireless network, and. Sometimes it's difficult to get things set up originally the, the first time. So the first time you actually connect your tablet or your phone directly to the to the unit, and then you tell it which um, network to connect to. Um, and part of the problem Pat was having is he's connected to the campus hmm. network before. And um, so these things, the other two units, one of us turning them on, they were connecting to the campus network, but they weren't able to sign in with a password. And so if, if they connect automatically to a network, um, it's uh, it's difficult to get them off of that network to connect to something else. So um, that's why we're using one unit instead of instead of three. You can only forget the network when you connect to them. Right. right, yep. And use a hotspot. So he was able to, to get in one of these was connecting to his hotspot so he could go in and tell it to connect to my hotspot so that we could communicate with it. Um, but then the, um, so the, the, the first one, so basically it, it's set up, he and the connect and the settings, he's told it to connect to this trip server um, that's about 300 meters away. Um, and then, so it's receiving corrections like every half a second or every second on the position of, of that uh, base station. And so it's a known reference point that'll help us um, correct this. Without the corrections, if you use this unit, you're getting no corrections. I mean, you'll see it. You can watch the point on a map and zoom in and you'll see it's moving all around with the connections after receiving a certain amount it'll it'll pretty much be uh pretty stable and what it told us with the with the uh vertical precision um earlier with the corrections it's claiming we're at about a um uh, one and a half centimeters of ac accuracy does it give you that? Uh, that little R with the arrow? Yeah, so R for rover. 
So, um, you know, on, th on this one, we're in the collection thing right now, which will show you a map. And then um, what we're going to do. 1.8 meter height. What's up? This is the height. 1.8 meters to the very bottom of this. Of, of this. And so that's because the, <clears throat> the measurements are uh, based on where the receiver is. So you have to, you tell it what the height of the, of the pole is. Uh, where I think we have to have Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when we want to collect a point, we want to use the, the bubble if you want to try to hold it steady. This is why I use a bipod all the time. I can't hold yeah. the pole. Legs, yeah. extra legs. Um, yeah. And, and then <clears throat> you will press to add a, add a point. And um, so he had already had it set up. So whenever it had a fix, um, it was going to collect for five seconds. And then it will average that out. I usually do. I do mine a little bit longer than that. But um, you always you always run into the case of if you leave, lose a fix after a certain amount of time, then you get a start over. So that's. Um, so you just press measure. Yeah, and it's finished with that point. Um, Is we there can. Is a place you can see the point on the table or something? Yeah. Well, we can go back, but it's, it's like a pin. If we zoom in, that's enough. If, yeah, once like you take a, a point, table. can you recall a table or something on the app where yeah. you can see or can yeah. maybe name your points too? And so right here, if you go back to project, but you can go here and uh, this that should be the table. So that's point number one okay. that, we, that we collected. Okay. And they've updated the software, which I haven't updated because I'm always scared to. Yeah. Um, things start stop working at some point. Um, but this one, then we can go on to like point, point two, if we go back, it's hard to see in there. And then the next one, we just go to and click the button. It'll automatically put a two in there. You can edit it and call it um, whatever, you, whatever you want also. After taking a bunch of points, can you export all the information as a CSV or something yeah. convenient? You can <laughs> CSV. I think there's a GeoJSON. Um, uh, there's a couple of different options. Now, the thing is, <clears throat> you need to export it before you turn it off because oh. um, it's connected to your wireless network. So if you turn it off, you pack it up. Then when you get back to where you are, um, you have to unpack everything and turn it back on and get it connected to be able to get your data out. Oh, but it won't erase your data. Right. Okay. Can you call issue. this point uh, number two, maybe? Just compare it to the picture. Uh, we can try on the old software. It's very hard to um, edit a point once you make one. You can also put in description too. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, get, you, if you want to get lunch. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, unless you, I mean, if it doesn't really matter what we're calling them, if we're, because my guess is I don't know Name. how many how many no, numbers. They're not that many. Yeah, you can call them number two. separate by position. But you may have multiple number twos out there too. So, but that's fine. It's not going to matter when Pat uses them because he doesn't. Uh, this means nothing to them. Um, yeah. Let's move to the okay. point. All right. Okay. But, uh, one thing I found is that uh, taking your phone and shooting a photograph of the control point in some kind of background, because your phone has position, will give you the approximate and context. Yeah. So I just time. Time. So, so it yeah. helps the overall results. Um, what about it, data reduction? Yeah. And it, it depends on what you're doing because for me, it doesn't um, it doesn't matter which one is which or where it is because I'm only using the GPS coordinates, nothing else. It doesn't matter 
what I call a NMI processing, I, you know, it's, it, you're usually pretty close. Uh, the problem I do have sometimes is if I'm flying a project at a really low altitude, then uh, sometimes uh, I need enough ground control points that you may be able to see two ground control points. But if anyone on Zoom has a question, go ahead and uh, unmute uh, yourself uh, and ask it. Which uh, one is what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you misidentify just one, it throws yep. the whole affair into a can. <laughs> I don't know if you want to keep following us. I think we'll stop unless anyone has on Zoom. You can unmute yourself and ask a question. That should work or put it in chat. Uh, but we'll stop the recording from here because this group needs to go deep. Around and, yeah, and and grab. you see the question about what software is being used? Could you repeat it? What is the software being used? This is, this On the is tablet. A, a specific um, app uh, for the GPS unit for MLIB. Uh, it's, called a, it's called Reach View, um, but it, it's specific for that unit. From the manufacturer. Yeah. I, I think there's other ways to um, set things up to try to use other apps to capture things, but I've, I've, I've never tried any anything else. So. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Chris, for the tour of mm -hmm. not many people use this. So it's kind of neat to see how it works. Okay. All right, you guys. Uh, thank okay. you so much for sharing. Thank you so much, Chris. You're welcome. There's another one over there. Yeah. All right. Okay. Drone Camp TV signing off. Bye, everybody. Be back at one.